about the theoretical construct of what's called the bell curve and how it correlates with a table called the standard normal table in your book that's in Appendix B in the back. Okay, so what we have here is this confusing bell curve that I'm going to try and walk you through. Anytime researchers survey a whole bunch of people, then you're eventually going to get uh, research results that simulate this bell curve. So, for example, before I get into all these different numbers up here, let's say somebody surveyed a thousand people and they were just trying to get an understanding of what their average grade was in a class. So they surveyed a thousand students. What we could expect is that the most students would get like a grade C. And let's say that's represented right here on this distribution of scores. Okay? So we would have a lot of students who got C grades and they would be represented right down the middle. That would be the highest frequency of your grades. Then you'd get some students who would get Bs, B pluses, Bs, B minuses, and then a smaller number of students who got A, A minuses, A's, and maybe a really small number who got A pluses. On the other side, uh, you'd have students who got D pluses, D's, and D minuses, a smaller number than who got C's, and you'd get a small number of students who got F's, who failed the course, maybe a really small number who didn't show up at all and got zeros. Okay? So that would simulate the theoretical construct of the bell curve. Okay? So, again, this is just a theoretical construct. It's hypothetical. So in a perfect bell curve, the mean, median, and the mode are all right down the middle of the distribution. Okay? Now, what you're going to learn is we're going to learn something called z-scores, and we'll get into those a little bit later. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how we use this theoretical bell curve to compare to real data. Now, again, with this being purely hypothetical, we're going to use it as a basis of comparison to compare to real data. And we do that through what's called calculating z-scores. So remember, last week we learned how to calculate the variance and then the standard deviation. We're going to use that to calculate z-scores. But what you want to think is in this hypothetical or theoretical bell curve, if we look right down the middle where the mean, median, and mode is, on one side you're going to have 50% of your distribution, okay? And on the other side, you're going to have 50% of your distribution. And then you're going to have what are called z-scores, okay? You calculate the z-score for a particular score within your sample by taking that score, subtracting the mean, and then dividing by your standard deviation. So again, we'll get to those examples a little bit later. But let's say you get a z-score of 1.0, positive 1.0. What we know by looking at the standard normal table in Appendix B of your book is that between the mean and your z-score of 1.0, you have 34.13% of your sample. On the other side, if you calculate a negative z-score of 1.0, there's also 34.13% of your sample between the mean and this z. Okay? Now, if you calculate a z-score of positive 2.0, it's going to be somewhere over here on your bell curve. Between 1.0 and 2.0 is 13.59% of the sample. Or, you can say from 2.0 beyond and beyond, in the tail of the bell curve, is only 2.28% of your sample. Again, on the other side, if you look at a z-score of negative 2.0, the area beyond Z in the tail of the bell curve is only 2.28%. So anything, the further along you are in your tail, the more of an outlier that Z-score is. The more unique it is, or the more we can say it's statistically significant in kind of the statistics language. Okay? The main thing you want to think is, the further away your Z-score is from the mean, the more significant that score is or the smaller the area is beyond Z. So for instance, you have negative 2.0 for a Z-score over here. It's far away from the mean. Your, the distance between the Z-score and the mean is big. So as your distance between the mean and Z increases, the significance of that score also increases because the area beyond Z goes down. It's more unique, it's more significant, the further along the tail you get. And the same thing on this side. Okay? 
So now we're going to look at two different examples looking at track and field results for the 100 meters. First in the last Olympics in 2008 looking at the runner Usain Bolt. And then after that we're going to look at Marion Jones and her winning time in the 100 meters back in 2000. And we'll see that both of them fall on a very significant level somewhere around here which makes them unique. But now we'll talk about how to calculate a level of statistical significance or find that level of statistical significance by looking at the standard normal table, by taking their z-score and putting it into, locating it on the standard normal table.